My name is Megan. I am the children's pastor, and I am usually out with the children. But I have the great honor to be with you this morning, and our kids are enjoying their Christmas party. So if you hear a lot of fun out there, don't be concerned. They're just having a party. It's a good day. So I love Christmas. I truly, truly love Christmas. I love the traditions. I love the familiarity of Christmas, the comfort of all that brings. Um, I'm the kind of person that likes the Christmas tree in the same corner of the room every year since I was a kid. And this year I broke from tradition and put it in the middle of the window. And was not my idea. It was my kid's idea. And that's the extent of a mother's love. You'll move the Christmas tree out of the perfect spot that it was in, but it's okay, we're, we're getting through it. But sometimes I can be guilty of putting a lot of emphasis on the wrong things. Um, the things that surround Christmas, not maybe the wrong things, but, but the fun things, right? Because it makes, us, it makes us happy, it brings joy, right? Because Christmas on the surface is sparkly and merry and bright. Um, it seems to be filled with all the feel-good emotions, wish list, picture-perfect moments, and good memories, all neatly wrapped up in a bow. But what if it's not? What if we spend so much time trying to create the perfect Christmas that we miss what Advent can bring to us. As we already heard this morning, merry and bright certainly isn't how the first Christmas looked. Humble shepherds out doing their job, they're pulling the night shift, there's nothing merry and bright about that. They're guarding their sheep when suddenly an angel of the Lord appears and the radiance of the Lord's glory shines around them. And I'm going to read it again. But in the wrong book, so I'm going to read it from my paper right here. Okay. It was chapter two, it was just the wrong book. And the angel said, Don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy for everyone. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born tonight in Bethlehem, the city of David. And this is how you will recognize him. You will find a baby lying in a manger, wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, suddenly. The angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God. Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth to whom God favors. It's Luke 2, it's not Mark 2, where I have my bookmark. And I know we heard this already, and thank you so much to the, um, our family, uh, Jumi and Tunji and Ethan and Adasa, who did such an incredible job reading this this morning. So beautiful. But this is a familiar portion of the Christmas story, right? Uh, perhaps you've memorized this whole portion of Scripture in a different version um, because you were the angel every year in the Christmas program. Maybe like I was, except it was in the King James. And I broke again from tradition and read from the NLT this morning. So I'm really shaking things up this Christmas. I see it as growth. I'm, I'm growing. But the angel said, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy. The Israelites were waiting a long time for this announcement. In fact, there were roughly 400 silent years, a time span where no new prophets were raised up and God revealed nothing new to his people. And now, to a group of lowly shepherds, the sky is filled with an angel who brings the most magnificent birth announcement that you can imagine, the glory of the Lord surrounding them and an army of angels filling the sky. Can you imagine that just for a moment? You thought you were just on a regular night of the job, you know, watching the sheep, stoking the fire, keeping, you know, counting all your sheep, when suddenly an angel appears, and you're the first to hear about the birth of Jesus the Messiah. You're the first to receive this good news of great joy for all people. And it's incredible that after 400 years of silence, God chose to break the silence to lowly shepherds. To Mary, a teenager. And of course, to the wise men as well. And we see that God was breaking the silence across national boundaries, social status, and cultural norms here. That the Savior for all people, was born. 
This really is Christmas in a nutshell, right? Good news of great joy. And maybe we can wrap our heads around this good news piece. I mean, the Savior of the world has been born, a light in the darkness, a hope for nations, wonderful counselor, prince of peace, our bright and morning star. This is good news. This is the greatest news. Of course, this would fill our hearts with joy. We have joy in our Savior. But what does joy really look like? When the heavenly hosts disappear and the sky grows dark, when all the sparkles and the glitter are swept away, when the feel-good moments have passed, and the worst of all, when the cookies have all been eaten, how can we have joy in the daily grind of life? And I invite you on a journey with me this morning, a short one, as we look at the concept of joy, what it is, and how we can experience it. And this morning, as we look at what is joy, I think joy is often misunderstood, and I'm, I may be wrong, but I don't think that joy and happiness are, syn are synonyms, even though we often use them interchangeably. Right? I think that joy is much deeper than happiness. Now, don't get me wrong, there's nothing, nothing wrong with happiness. Who doesn't want to be happy? Uh, it feels good. It's enjoyable. Um, we like to be happy. We like to do things that make us happy, and we like to avoid the things that don't. However, happiness is more fleeting or circumstantial, while joy is more sustaining and strengthening. Happiness is often tied to something external, another person, a place, a thing, a situation. And these factors spark happiness in us, right? It's a feeling, it's an emotion. And again, there's nothing wrong with feelings or emotions. We're human, they're a beautiful part of life. And if you know me at all, you know I have all kinds of feelings and emotions. But they're also fleeting. They're coming and going, depending on what we face in each moment. Just, just an example, like maybe when you get a new puppy about 10 days ago, just say that happened to you. <laughs> it happened to me, and it fills your kids' bellies with giggles and laughter and smiles on their faces, and they have so much joy, right? And then, then... You, as, as the mom, are trying to house train this puppy at 2.30 in the morning when it's an ice, rain, snow, sleet outside and the freezing rain's dropping on your head and the wind is cutting through your bones and you don't feel it. It's just not the same, right? Happiness is not the emotion that came to, you know, the surface in that moment, but maybe it was the joy on my kids' faces that sustained me through it. Um, but, you know, we can't just build a life upon happiness. Uh, many of us are in the pursuit of happiness, right? But once we get it, it can feel like sand falling through our fingers. It's great while it lasts, but that's just it. It doesn't last, and it leaves us wanting more. You know what I'm talking about, because I'm sure you've seen this, you've experienced this yourself, whether it's a baby, you know, who's enjoying its milk and it's happy and content until it's all gone and they want more, or a kid with candy. You haven't seen joy until you see a kid with candy, right? And I'm a children's pastor and I'm also a mom, but when I hand kids candy, all your children, I'm doing that as a pastor, not the mom and me. I put that to the side, and I want to make the kids happy, right? So I give them candy until it's gone. Or you upload their favorite episode to Netflix or to YouTube, and they're just filled with glee until it's over, and they want more. Or you fill up your cup of coffee in the morning, and you just, oh, the happiness that just fills your soul when you take that first sip, until all of a sudden you look down, and it's gone, and you're left wanting more. Maybe it's your social media posts. They get liked, they get shared, feels good, right? We, we like that feeling of happiness until it stops and we're left wanting more. So you fill in the blank. Happiness is blank until it's gone and we're left wanting more. It doesn't satisfy us, right? It doesn't fulfill us. It's here, it's enjoyable, it feels good, and then it's gone as the next feeling washes 
in. In fact, this past year, I've experienced a lot of feelings, a lot of emotions, and I'm sure you have too. And if I'm honest, they weren't all happiness. In fact, I'd venture to say if we were to list all the feelings we've had this past year, I don't know, would happiness make the top of the list? Would, would joy? Because collectively, we've weathered a lot, haven't we? Individually, we have probably weathered more. We've read headlines, articles, we've watched news stories, reels, clips, posts that have rocked our nation, our, our hemisphere, our globe. On top of that, we've walked our own paths filled with pain, illness, death, sickness, betrayal, darkness, hopelessness. We've had questions without answers, unimaginable heartbreak, loneliness, injustice, and the list goes on. So how do we find joy in a world like this? How do we find joy in a world with so much bad news? As I've said, we've, we've consumed a lot of news we, we do as a people. We're bombarded with it. And the scrolling news feed on our screens and even in our minds may not be an encouraging one. Just think, when someone says to you, I've got news, do you expect it to be good news or bad news? Does that statement fill you with anticipation for what they're going to say or a little bit of anxiety? I know it was a really cheerful Christmas message you came for this morning, isn't it? So nice. But there is a headline, though, that has lasted through the millennia. There is a news that still rings true no matter what else we are bombarded with. Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news of great joy for everyone. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born tonight in Bethlehem, the city of David. This truth doesn't change, for God so loved the world that he sent his son. That is the good news of great joy. But, again, how does this translate to the here and now? We know that Jesus came to earth. We believe that this was a part of God's rescue plan. We understand the good news piece. But where sometimes I, and maybe I'm not the only one, kind of gets stuck on is the, the great joy. We've already covered happiness this morning, right? That fleeting, feel-good feeling that we all love so much. But that's just it. It's temporary, and it changes with each situation we are in. We have bad days where we don't feel happy, yet we can have joy and hardship. And this is why I believe that joy and happiness are really two different things. Happiness is based mainly on external factors, where joy is an internal characteristic, a choice, a fruit. I was doing some reading this week on happiness versus joy, and it was, it was really interesting, and I came across this article from Compassion, and if you're familiar with this organization, they're a wonderful organization, and no doubt um, those connected with compassion would have a deep understanding of joy. And I thought it so beautifully summed up this concept. And I just want to read a portion of this article to you. It says, The difference between joy and happiness lives in the mind and heart. Joy is a little word, and happiness is a bigger word. Joy is in the heart. Happiness is on the face. Joy is of the soul, and happiness is of the moment. Joy transcends Happiness reacts. Joy embraces peace and contentment waiting to be discovered. Joy runs deep and overflows while happiness hugs hello. Joy is a practice and a behavior is deliberate and intentional. Happiness comes and goes along its way. Joy is profound and scriptural. Don't worry, rejoice. Happiness is a balm. Don't worry, be happy. Joy is an inner feeling, and happiness is an outward expression. Joy endures hardship and trials and connects with meaning and purpose. 
A person pursues happiness, but chooses joy. And this piece, this last piece I'll read, it's a great article if you want to check it out. But it goes on to say, it's possible to experience joy in difficult times. It's possible to know joy or feel it in spite of grief or uncertainty. Joy doesn't need a smile to exist, although joy feels better with a happy smile. And here it is. Joy can share space with other emotions, sadness, fear, anger, even unhappiness. And happiness can't. Isn't that powerful? And I think that's the real difference there. Joy can share space with other emotions. Sadness, fear, anger, even happiness. But right, ha happiness can't do that. And I think so often we try to skip over those emotions, right? Sadness, fear, anger, because they seem unspiritual, unpleasant, so we ignore them, we push them away, or we try to speed through them. But we can have joy and still have those other emotions. Having joy doesn't or, or, or can't mean that we won't have sadness, anger, fear. I mean, that's unrealistic, right? We're human beings. That's the beauty of joy. It can hold space with other emotions and still be joy. Of course, you know, we're not going to always go around with a happy smile on our faces and the surface level feeling of happiness, right? That, that's happiness, that's good, but that's not joy. Joy is internal. Joy is steadfast. Joy is deep. Joy is lasting. Joy doesn't change with our situations. Rather, it helps sustain us through difficult ones. Joy doesn't need happiness to exist, although happiness can exist with joy. Because happiness we can grasp, right? But joy, we have to grapple with. Joy is indeed a fruit of the Spirit. It's not just solely a human emotion or a choice, but is a work of the Spirit of God. Fruit takes time to grow. If you look at this Greek word for joy, an example is, is cheerfulness or calm delight? A calm delight that comes from the Lord. And I'm sure we all know people who have this calm delight. Maybe there's someone in your life, or maybe it's you. And you know, they've experienced, or you've experienced, a difficult path in life. There's been pain, loss, heartache, sickness, injustice. Yet, they still seem to have this calm delight. This joy that is so apparent in their life that it just bubbles out of them. And it's just so beautiful. So now as we, you know, kind of understand and wrestle a bit through happiness and joy, I think we can move on to the next question, which is how can I experience joy? I don't think there's um, a special formula to experience joy. If you do A, B, and C, then you'll experience joy. Um, nope. <laughs> the Bible doesn't, it doesn't work that way, but the Bible does give us a solid practice, a solid principle that leads to the growth and the development of joy in our lives. And Paul writes to the Thessalonian church um, in 1 Thessalonians, and I, I got that one right here. Chapter 5, verse 16 says, always be joyful. Keep on praying. No matter what happens, always be thankful, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. And this church uh, that Paul was writing to, from a human perspective, they, they had every reason not to be joyful. You see, they were experiencing persecution from the outside and friction among themselves. Yet in Christ, they're told to be more joyful. And this is what makes joy in the life of a believer so unique. It emerges under the most adverse circumstances. This is not a typical human response, of course, but it reminds us that our joy is really from God. We see how closely joy or rejoicing, prayer, and thankfulness are connected. I believe having a practice of these three things can deepen and can grow our joy. 
Because what's related to constant joy is incessant prayer. Now, this doesn't mean we're going around, right, and all you ever do every second of the day is utter prayers. We know that's impossible. Uh, we never get anything else done. But what this is is in uninterrupted communion with God. This keeps the temporal things of earth and the spiritual values in balance. This is a heart condition and attitude of prayer and communion with God. And this communion with God really deepens our dependence on him. So while we're going about our regular day-to-day -day activity, our hearts are lifted towards God. And next we read here to be thankful no matter what happens. Now this is a tough one. <laughs> And one commentator wrote concerning these verses that Paul never instructed the church to thank God for evil events, but to thank God that even in evil times and circumstances, our hope remains and that God continues his work in our lives. How we can continue to be thankful and rejoice in difficult times isn't the difficulties themselves, but it's having a continual attitude of being aware of God's presence. Emmanuel, God with us. Sometimes joy or rejoicing is an acknowledgement that no matter what we face, we don't face it alone. God is with us. It's reminding ourselves of the work on the cross and the future hope that we have in Christ because no matter what we face, this doesn't change. The cross remains the same. The work of the cross, the hope that we have in Christ, remembering who has the final word. This doesn't deny the difficulty, but it acknowledges that God is with us in it and through it. Joy and prayer foster peace, but more precisely, they lead to thanksgiving, which then generates peace. So not only can joy be present and grow in our lives, joy and prayer together can lead us to thanksgiving unto God, which also generates peace in our lives, right? And these fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, and on and on, they're connected. They're not individual things. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit. It's deeper and more internal and more sustaining than just happiness. When we find our joy in the Lord, right? Scripture sets forth this principle of rejoicing, of prayer, and of gratitude. And as I prepare to conclude, I'll ask the worship team to come back. I told you it wasn't too long of a journey. But if we have a posture of prayer and gratitude, joy and peace can grow will grow in our lives. We can always find things to not be thankful for. We can always find things to complain about. And if you're never sure what to complain about, the weather always is just always there waiting to be complained about, right? But when we begin to truly look for ways to thank God in each circumstance, when we live with a heart posture of communion with him, joy will be an internal characteristic that can carry us through, even when we don't feel it. Okay, someone's with me. Thanks, my friend. Now, I'm by no means, right, saying that we, we shouldn't acknowledge our, our pain, um, our trauma, or our hurt and our loss. We absolutely should acknowledge it, and we, we need to process it with others, with professionals. It's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that even in life's difficulties, in the mess, and in the pain, we can find gratitude, communion with God, and a lasting joy. As I said, this isn't an easy formula, right? This is a heart practice. This is discipleship. This is spiritual growth, rejoicing, prayer, gratitude at all times. Because, you know, no matter what we face, the headline that the angels deliver to the shepherds over 2,000 years ago still rings true. Behold, I bring you good news of great joy for all people. Behold, I bring you 
good news of great joy for all people. Nothing can take that truth away. No pain, no diagnosis, no sickness, no loss can ever change the fact that God loves you so much that he sent Jesus for you. This doesn't diminish your pain, but it reminds us that our pain doesn't have the final word. That God is with us, that God is for us, that he is with us in this daily journey of life here on earth. And we have hope for eternity with him where he makes all things right. And in this Christmas season, when maybe not everything feels merry and bright and, and happy and, and, and light and good, we can take comfort because of this good news of great joy. Joy comes from knowing the Savior was born. Joy comes from accepting the miraculous work on the cross. Joy comes from acknowledging that no matter what we face in this life, it is not forever and we have hope. Because joy can settle down deep in our souls and sustain us because our joy is in the Lord. And when life throws us curveballs and we face difficulties, we can come back to the cross. You know, we can't really talk about Christmas without talking about the cross because when that baby was born and laid in a manger, his mission was always for us. Motivated by great love, you are so deeply and so fully loved by God. So much so that he sent his own son for you. And allow that power of that truth to settle into your hearts this morning. You are loved. You are not alone. You are not forgotten. You are not forsaken. You can experience joy in this life because our joy is built upon a solid foundation. Our joy can be unshakable because he is unshakable. We'll experience all kinds of feelings this Christmas season. Happiness, excitement, anticipation, stress, apprehension, anger, fear, grief. Remember, Joy can hold space with all of that. Jesus can hold space with all of that. Because Emmanuel, God with us in all of that. As we take a few moments to sing, I encourage you to, to lift up your heart to God, to sing to him, to experience his joy. Step into joy. Commune with him. Give thanks. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy. The Messiah has come. His name is Jesus wonderful counselor, prince of peace, everlasting father.
your great love for us. Thank you, Jesus, for coming. Holy Spirit, thank you that you are here bringing your comfort, your healing, your peace. Lord, may we not miss the miracle of Christmas in this busy season. May we not just strive after happiness and and those things that are on the surface, God, but help us to dig down deep into you, into your word, into joy. Thank you, Jesus, that not only can can joy hold space, but, but Jesus, you hold space with us where we are right now. Thank you, God, that you love us each and every one that God there was no one outside of your love no one outside of your reach for God so loved the world that he sent his son we rejoice in that we cling to that hope we hold on to that we love you God in your name amen